Good morning. Welcome to worship here on the second Sunday of Pentecost, the longest season of the beautiful church year. The Lord be with you. If you're joining us as a guest or a visitor, welcome. I look forward to meeting you and getting to know you in person. And before that, by FaceTime or Facebook Live or Skype, which I've done with multiple virtual visitors. So please scroll down in YouTube or Vimeo and see the link to our welcome card. It's a really easy and quick card to fill out. And if you leave contact information, we'll contact you for a virtual visit with me. No pressure, though. We'll do it when you desire that. For those of you who have never been to our beautiful campus in person, a virtual video campus tour is on the docket and will be available to you soon. Our own Nicole Hoplin is the tour guide. For those of you who are brand new among us, if you'd like to follow along in the service with the materials posted, please scroll down in Vimeo or YouTube to see the link to our website. That will give you access to our worship materials. And we try our best to provide what you need to participate on screen. But for full materials, please access the worship bulletin, which will have all the lyrics and other items you may desire. The kids' message, delivered by our director of Christian Ed, Andy Muick, is available on a separate video. The worship folder contains a bunch of other materials, including for Sunday school announcements and so on. Later today in the mid-afternoon, today's message should be available by podcast in your favorite podcast vehicle, whether it's Apple, Google, Spotify, et al. Search GSLCVA. The past midweek recharge entitled The Pandemic of Fear should already be available via podcast. So, muster your materials, not just for watching, but for worship, participation. You're invited wherever you are as the Spirit moves you during the service to sit or stand, bend the knee, close your eyes, bow your heads, fold your hands, cross your head and heart, whatever ways that assist your worship. Who cares if no one's around you or it's just your family around God is present with us in worship. He sees always. Sometimes when I'm driving past where you live or the hospital or nursing home or retirement home where you are right now, I will cross my head and heart and park the car briefly to pray for you and be in worship to the Lord for your sake in the name of Jesus. We don't have to be inside the walls of this place to worship the Lord properly. So lest I stray into an opening sermon soliloquy, now we join together in praise, prayer, and hearing God's words of challenge and comfort in these days. We begin in, in the name of the Father, who loved us so very much that he sent his Son to suffer and die for us, and of such a gracious Son that Jesus Christ, who rose victoriously over the grave and vanquished evil and death, and of the Holy Spirit who strengthens and comforts us during these days of uncertainty and unrest. Amen. And now to the opening hymn.
Yes, indeed, our foundation is our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, through whom we receive the central need of our existence, forgiveness of sins. As we head to receiving that crucial forgiveness, we address the great forgiver. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, the one God, whose steadfast love is everlasting, whose faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Amen. Trusting in the mercy of God, we confess our sin, we reflect in silence. We now confess together. Reconciling God, we confess that we do not trust your abundance and we deny your presence in our lives. We place our hope in ourselves and rely on our own efforts. We fail to believe that you provide enough for all. We abuse your good creation for our own benefit. We fear difference and do not welcome others as you have welcomed us. We sin in thought, word, and deed. By your grace, forgive us. Through your love, renew us. And in your spirit, lead us so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Amen. Beloved of God, by the abundance of divine mercy, we have peace with God through Christ Jesus, through whom we have obtained grace upon grace. Our sins are forgiven, and so we live now in hope. For God's hope does not disappoint, since his immense and unconditional love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now for the word of the Lord. Good morning. The first reading is from the book of Exodus, the 19th chapter. The Israelites had journeyed from Rephidim, entered the wilderness of Sinai, and camped in the wilderness. Israel camped there in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God. The Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the Israelites, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession out of all the peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the Israelites. So Moses came summoned the elders of the people, and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. The people all answered as one, Everything that the Lord has spoken, we will do. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from the book of Romans, the fifth chapter. Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now we hear the good news according to the Apostle Matthew, who left his work as the tax collector to follow Jesus. The ninth chapter of his account, beginning at the 35th verse, and then continuing on to the 10th chapter. Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless 
like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Then Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus. Simon, the Canaanian, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You received without payment, give without payment. Take no gold or silver or copper in your belts, no bag for your journey or two tunics or sandals or a staff, for laborers deserve their food. Whatever town or village you enter, find out who in it is worthy and stay there until you leave. As you enter the house, greet it. If the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet as you leave that house or town. Truly, I tell you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. See, I am sending you out like sheep into the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of them, for they will hand you over to councils and flog you in their synagogues. And you will be dragged before governors and kings because of me, as a testimony to them and the Gentiles. When they hand you over, do not worry about how you are to speak or what you are to say. For what you are to say will be given to you at that time. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Brother will betray brother to death. And a father, his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all because of my name. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly, I tell you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. This indeed is the gospel of the Lord which stirs us from our doldrums and spurs us to join Christ in his mission. Thanks be to God for his powerful teachings. And now, as we prepare our hearts for the hearing of the message, we join in singing the hymn of the day.
Grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus. Dr. Paul Brand, who worked so wonderfully with those who have leprosy, you see him here pictured on the far right, writes this in his book, Fearfully and Wonderfully Made, that Jesus reached out his hand and touched the eyes of the blind. He touched the skin of the person with leprosy and the legs of the cripple. When a woman pressed against him in a crowd to tap into the healing energy she hoped was there, Jesus felt the drain of that energy, stopping the noisy crowd and asking, who touched me? Why did Jesus so frequently touch the people he healed, many of whom must have been unkempt or diseased, unsanitary and smelly? With his power, he easily could have waved a magic wand. In fact, a wand would have reached more people than a touch. He could have divided the crowd into affinity groups and organized his miracles, paralyzed people over there, feverish people over here, people with leprosy there, raising his hands to heal each group efficiently in mass. But he didn't. Jesus' mission wasn't chiefly a crusade against disease, but rather ministry to individual people. He wanted those people one by one feel his love and warmth and his full identification with them. Jesus knew he could not readily demonstrate love to a crowd, for love usually involves touching. Paul Brand's words. Although Brand's parents went as missionaries to preach the gospel, they soon found themselves involved in the fields of medicine and agriculture, education, evangelism, and language translation. After all, ministry is holistic. They invested seven years in India before anyone converted to Christianity. Mission work and gospel outreach is hard. And in fact, that first conversion came as a direct result of healing love. Villagers in that part of India would often abandon their sick outside their homes, and then the brands would come and care for them. Once, when a Hindu priest was dying of the flu, he sent his own frail, sickly nine-month-old daughter to be raised by the brands. None of his fellow Hindu swamis would care for that sick child, but the brands took her in, nursed her to health, and adopted her as their own. Paul Brand gained a sister, Ruth, and his parents gained an unexpected response of trust in that community. The villagers were so moved by this example of Christian love. Now, years later, Granny Brand, when she was 85, long after Paul Brand's father had died, helped forge a medical breakthrough. She had often treated abscesses on the legs of mountain people by draining the pus and removing a long, thin, guinea worm. Distressed by the frequency of these absences in the community, she studied the problem carefully and learned that the worm's life cycle included a larval stage spent in water. And knowing the people's habits well, she quickly deduced that wading in water was probably the means of the transmission of the virus. So cashing in on the trust and love she had built up through decades of personal ministry in India, she rode her horse from village to village to village, 85 years old, urging the people to build stone walls around their shallow wells and to prevent foot contact with the water. And so, in a few years, this old lady single-handedly caused the eradication of all such worms and their resulting abscesses, covering two complete mountain ranges. Brand concluded, I wonder how effective Granny Brand would have been had she dropped information leaflets from an airplane. In Hebrews we're told that Jesus is touched with the feelings of our infirmities, that he experienced suffering through his humanness. God, through Jesus, dwelt among us and touched us and was touched by us and fully identified with our pain. And that is part and parcel of the uniqueness of Christianity, that we touch people. In today's gospel, we hear 
that Jesus calls into service the 12 disciples and sends them as missionaries to touch people. The great historian of those times, Josephus, described that in Galilee there were probably at least 3 million people living in about 204 cities and villages. And Jesus moved about all of these places, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Whether they were tucked in little obscure hamlets on the hillsides, or whether they were down in the heat of the valley, or whether they were in the large cities that ringed the sea itself, he went everywhere, in the vineyards and in the fields, and he met the people and their needs. Jesus healed every sickness and every disease among the people. For all intents and purposes in his lifetime, Jesus utterly banished disease from Galilee. In fact, John says in his gospel that all of the books of the world couldn't contain all of the things that he did. The miracles of chapter 8 and 9, and there are basically nine miracles, are only samples in various categories of expressions of power. By no means do they come anywhere near the number of miracles that biblical scholars say Jesus actually did. So, why did he heal every sickness and disease among the people? Well, number one, because it was a way to verify his message. You see, Jesus went into the synagogue and taught differently than all the other teachers. He went into the highways and byways and preached differently. He said things that were diametrically opposed to the things that people were being taught by their leaders of the time. And he was in utter disagreement with the leading religious lights of his day. Now, why would people listen to this carpenter from Nazareth? Well, frankly, the miracles were the thing that convinced him that he was special. They were verifiers of his message. The blind man had it right when he said, we know that this man must be of God. Or leading Pharisee Nicodemus had it right when he said, we know that no man can do the things that you do except God be with him. So Jesus did these miracles to demonstrate the loving tenderness of God also. He wanted people to know that God was compassionate, that God was sympathetic, that God was tender, that God was loving, that he was filled with kindness, that he was merciful. This tenderness is an integral part of Jesus' ministry, and it is essential in ours as well. You can teach the word of God. You can proclaim the good news of the kingdom and how to enter it. But Jesus touched people where they hurt. Jesus was sympathetic and kind and caring and loving and tender. And that's a major part of legitimate ministry. What motivated him? Open quote. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they were faint and were scattered abroad as sheep, having no shepherd. So you can picture Jesus on an elevated place, perhaps on a hillside. And he's looking down the bank, the slope. He sees this mass of people before him. And they came mostly with physical needs, diseases and deformities and hunger. And he sees them, but he sees beyond the physical to the metaphysical, to the everlasting needs. The word compassion from the Latin compassio means to suffer with. Indeed, Jesus suffered with them. It is his nature to care. Now, the Greek term here is intriguing. It literally means to feel something in the bowels. The word splachtnon is the noun form, and it means bowels. And we would use it in the vernacular today and say the guts. Jesus was moved in the guts for them. What a strange thing to express concern. I mean, if you were to go to your girlfriend and say, I love you, honey, with all of my bowels, she may no longer date you. Usually romance wins over the explicit sharing of anatomy. In the 19th chapter, you see Jesus on the cross and he's hanging there with those four great wounds in his body, and if ever there was a moment when he could have thought of himself, it would have been then. But he looks down from the cross, and he sees this little lady, 
his mother Mary. And he knows that he isn't going to be around anymore to care for her as her earthly son. And he knows that dad Jesus is de- uh, Joseph is dead, we assume, and that the brothers and sisters in the family have not yet believed and don't until after the resurrection. So who's going to take care of Mary? And that's what's on Jesus' heart. And so he commits her to his disciple John and John to her. And once that's done, he can go ahead and die. Compassion. There's a second element in his motive. Open quote. They were faint and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. So he moves from his nature to the need and he saw the hurting in their real condition. He wasn't fooled by their religious fronts. He wasn't fooled by their facades or the superficiality. And he uses two tremendously rich words here. Faint and scattered abroad don't really translate the core meaning of the Greek words eskilmenoi and eriminoi, two very poignant words. The first one can mean worn out, exhausted. It can mean beaten up, battered, mangled, ripped, torn. The people were devastated. That's how Jesus saw them. He saw them as mutilated, worn out, exhausted, battered, bruised, beaten. The second word means to be thrown down, lying prostrate, totally helpless. It means that the folks were mangled and thrown on the ground, lying prostrate and utterly helpless. That's how Jesus saw the people. It was as if they had no shepherd, no leader, no one serving them. They were spiritually worn out, exhausted, left to suffer. Now the scribes and the Pharisees claim to be the shepherds of Israel. This is an indictment of those who didn't show those people any pasture. Their spiritual leaders didn't feed them. Their spiritual leaders didn't bind their wounds. They were plundered by the scribes and the Pharisees, and now they were lying prostrate, devastated. May God have mercy on the souls of those leaders. It is a graphic picture of the uncaring, unconcerned leadership. And we see the weariness, the bewilderment, and the wounds that have left these people desolate. They're called again in chapter 10, verse 6. You see, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And the phrase literally means the sheep that have perished. They were offering a religion that didn't lift burdens. It bound burdens on them. So Jesus and the Pharisees were often in debate. The Pharisees were fooling around with subtle arguments about the law and their traditions instead of talking about tending the sheep. In Matthew 23, Jesus says, you devour widows' houses. You bind on my people. 23.4 23.4 says, needless burdens. And in 23.13, Jesus says, you shut people out of the kingdom. What an indictment. Ouch. And I see this today. Some people say, oh, you know, you shouldn't speak against this situation. You shouldn't speak against those other religions. You shouldn't say anything against those other groups or leaders. But what if unloving shepherds are shutting people out of the kingdom of God? They're depriving them and leaving them lying prostrate and helpless. What to do? Can you imagine how wonderful it must have been then when the people heard Jesus say the following, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. So next is Jesus urging to pray for laborers. We can sit around and just say, oh, Lord, save my old aunt. Lord, save my husband. Lord, save my neighbor. Oh, Lord, save my neighbor, please. And after a while you realize, well, they're not getting saved. I better keep praying. And then maybe you start to pray this way. Lord, please send someone to reach my neighbor. Or Lord, provide us good leaders who can eradicate racism. 
and just keep praying that for a long time until pretty soon you're going to say to yourself, hmm, I think maybe I ought to go. You see, if what you're doing is praying for the person to be saved, which is a great ministry in and of itself, you still can keep the person at arm's length. But as soon as you start praying for the Lord to send a person or the person, you're going to soon feel like maybe you're the person who ought to go. And that leads you from intercession to involvement as described in chapter 10, verse 1. And that's exactly what happened. Jesus said, now you disciples pray. And then in verse 1, when he had called to him, The 12 disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out, heal all manner of sickness, all manner of disease, and so forth, and he sent them. God wants us to have insight, of course, that we understand people are lost. But then to take it to a higher level, that there are few to reach them. And so then we begin to pray differently. And then out of our prayers come our own involvement. Lord, provide me a good life group leader becomes, Lord, send me, equip me to be a humble new life group leader. Use me as your vessel. Use me, this broken person, this sinful person, this humble person, use me. Now as your pastor, I'm not so concerned that you all sign on some dotted line. I'm just concerned that you get on your knees. And if you start praying for the lost, the hurting, the devastated, the prostrate, long enough, God will pull you to them. There's an interesting phrase in verse 38. It says, he will send forth laborers. And the original sentence here employs a very strong Greek term that means to thrust them forth. So when faced with a need, we don't panic, we pray. And as we pray, we find that maybe we are going to be the ones that God sends. As the disciples prayed and found themselves to be the ones who were involved. Simple fishermen, a tax collector, a thief, a rebel. Or of me, after I ran away from the ministry and God thrust me back into the ministry. Speaking of involvement, one night in the east end of London, a young doctor was turning out the lights of a mission hall in which he was working. He found a ragged little boy hiding in a dark corner. And the little boy asked him to please let him stay there because it was warm in that corner and he could sleep and it was a nicer place than where he normally slept. And so the doctor took the homeless little boy to his own place. He fed him, bathed him, and learned that the boy was living in a cold bin with a number of other little boys. So the doctor asked the little fellow if he'd take him to where the cold bin was. And so they went through the narrow alleys of London, and finally in the darkness of night, they came to a hole in the wall of an old factory. Look in there, the little boy said. And so the doctor struck a match, And he looked inside through the hole and crawled into a filthy coal bin cellar. And there he found 13 little boys clothed with only bits of old burlap to protect them from the bitter cold London night. And one little fella had clinging to him tightly, a four-year-old little brother. They were all orphans. The doctor, then and there, immediately caught a vision of how he would serve the Lord after praying for a long time. And his name was Dr. Thomas Bernardo, who came to care for those little boys and for many other little boys and girls as well. And at the time of his death here on earth, the newspapers of London reported that Bernardo had taken and surrounded with a Christian atmosphere over 80,000 homeless children, 80,000 orphans. And so many of them became powerful Christians because this servant, Bernardo, had the heart of Christ to draw those kids from darkness into the light through his engagement 
and active, personal mission efforts. So friends, Christ has called us to teach his word, to proclaim his kingdom, but to also touch people and their lives and to be moved to tenderness because his love is in us and because we see their plight, their condition. And he's asked us to analyze it, to have insight, to intercede on their behalf by asking God to send forth laborers. And then when the call comes, like for Isaiah, here am I, send me. Amen. And now for the announcements. It is so good to be with you and share God's peace and hope with you. Again, for first-time visitors who are joining us, welcome, Galore. You're always welcome among us virtually and when we get together in person. And if you're looking to God and the church these days of unrest and uncertainty and fear, we encourage you to continue joining us for comfort and reassurance and hope and strength. Visitors and all, please mark your attendance and share your prayer requests on the virtual welcome card in today's worship materials. That will help us to make our shared ministry as current and engaging and helpful and informed as possible. And please do put our prayer chain to work intercessing for you. Our prayer warriors are in their prayer war rooms ready, willing, and empowered by the Holy Spirit. And speaking of prayer, weekly prayer meetings on Wednesday evenings continue. I invite you to join this gathering, especially during these days when we have so much to pray for about health and unrest, the economy, the future. Anyone is welcome. Prayer chain warriors, you are invited to join this prayer huddle as well. This past week, I assigned this prayer huddle several prayer requests about which to intercess on our behalf. And you will need to sign up for this gathering so that we can provide tech security. Please see the announcements on our worship page and join this huddle. This is a time when prayer is more important than ever. Life groups, clusters, Sunday school classes, other gatherings continue online. My own new Sunday school class starts today, virtual coffee with the pastor at 10 a.m. We're focusing in on the word of the Lord from the past week's midweek recharge and engaging in discussion about that devotion from the midweek recharge as well. You'll need to fill out a super quick sign-up form for the sake of tech security again. Please see our news and announcements posted on the worship materials page and connect. And class, please participate in the most current midweek recharge before attending the class. This coming midweek recharge is entitled, Can't it Get Over That Hump? Need a hand? The Lord is at hand. A prayer and music will follow that devotion, and you not only get these midweek recharges by video uh, on Vimeo, YouTube, or by text on our website, you can also now get these uh, midweek recharges by podcast on Apple or Google or Spotify, Listen Notes, several other platforms. Next, the Good Shepherd Return to Campus Committee is deep in its thoughtful work, and as the committee works hard, uh, the members thereof, the Board of Servant Leaders, staff, and I ask for your patience, understanding, and charity. We all have our opinions or desires, some of which will be uh, garnered through the survey, but we're going to make plans to return as a congregation together. Whether hybrid, virtual, in-person, or outdoors in worship and ministry, 
We give thanks to God for your continuing and considerable generosity in supporting the ministries of this church. And in these challenging days, you continue to reveal the strong faith with which the Lord has endowed you in so many ways, including through your faithful giving. In fact, that kind of attitude and charity and giving revealed by our members, our past members now worshiping with us, our members-to-be, our friends and family of members, and our guests and visitors enable us to continue in mission in different ways with passion and power. In fact, during these weeks, we're sharing and extending the gospel beyond the walls of our church in historic numbers. And so many of you requested the Pentecost sermon be put on a separate YouTube or Vimeo file simply so that you can share that with your friends and family, classmates, neighbors, and colleagues as you engage them in dialogue about racism and unrest. And so we did that. And some of you have already shared that sermon by podcast with those in your network. So that's great too. Again, no looting, no racism, no pandemic, no war, storm, hurricane, snow, hail, sleet, technical glitches, no anti-Christian attitudes, no persecution, no brutality. Nothing will stop the extension of Christ's mission and in the advancement of God's kingdom. Thy kingdom come, O Lord. You and I are empowered by the Holy Spirit to relentlessly care for people, discipling, teaching, healing, service, moving forward in mission. Next, we celebrate with our students who have graduated this year, particularly our high school, college students. We know the graduation gatherings this year are not nearly what we were hoping, uh, but God has great plans for you. Your future in society, your future in the workforce, professions, in service, in the church, and in the mission of Christ. So get ready. Your time is coming. Speaking of gatherings, until we're back in our fellowship hall and gathering place at all, to a fellowship in person, come to our Facebook page and socialize. This past week, we posted Josh Linder, our board secretary and life group leader, sharing his tech tutorial for those of you just starting out on Facebook and video conferencing. Uh, no shame in that. You should be seeing a virtual campus tour uh, soon. Much more to come. So come to our Facebook page for information, pics, and socializing, tutorials, keeping in touch. We do also plan to start an Instagram page at some point soon. It's not the same as in-person sharing, but until that happens, we can do a good amount virtually. So come on to our Facebook page and later on our Instagram page. Now as we join in the offering, we prayerfully consider a one-time gift or recurring gifts to enable the expansion of God's kingdom. If you haven't had an opportunity to sign up for online giving and are ready to do so now, please see the instructions on screen in a moment. You can also continue to give by text. That info will also be on screen soon or by mailing in your contribution. Let's take a bit of time now to consider giving prayerfully or to make your contribution now as we also lift up the musical offering, the anthem, to our great provider.
Let's pray. God of goodness and growth, all creation is yours. And your faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. Nourish us through your gifts that we might proclaim your steadfast love in our communities and in the world through Jesus Christ, our strength and our song. Amen. And now we continue our service with the prayers of this congregation. Called into unity with one another and the whole creation, let us pray for our shared world. Holy One, you bring us together and call us your own. Bless the theologians, teachers, and preachers who help us grow in faith. Bless the ongoing ministry of Pastors Johan, James, and Peterson, Andy Muick, Susie Hardwick, and preschool staff, Heidi Cooper, Vicki Peter, Melinda Dewan, Paul Kasoulis, life group leaders, and many other servants. Guide your church that we might be a holy people full of faith. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Holy One, the whole earth is yours. Where there is fire, bring cool air and new growth. Where there is flooding, bring abatement. Where there is drought, bring rain. Inspire us to care for what you have provided. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We call on your spirit of unity, giving thanks for our different backgrounds, cultures, ethnicities, languages, and vocations. Activate and employ the diverse gifts present in your church, that they reveal your love for all. Grant the wisdom to see beyond the boundaries of race, color, ethnicity, culture, background, and language toward that common humanity that makes all of us your beloved and neighbors to one another. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of counsel, all authority belongs to you. Encourage the leaders of this in every land to seek peace, equality, and unity. Instill wisdom and perseverance in advocates who work toward justice in often ignored communities. To those who have taken up arms in anger or revenge, even in the cause of justice or raising awareness, grant conversion to peaceful but strong, truthful dialogue, as well as meaningful and fruitful collaboration. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Holy One, we have created divisions you will not make. In places of conflict, raise up leaders who work to develop lasting peace, justice, and reconciliation. Encourage organizations and individuals who care for all forced to leave their homes, especially in these dire times. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Provide each one of us a heart for fairness and empathy. Encourage the nations, states, and localities to share their resources and provide wisdom to public officials and decision makers. Protect workers and families most vulnerable among us during these days, as many face difficult dilemmas among finances, safety, and peaceful protest. Provide hope to those furloughed, unemployed, or without health insurance. Bless the ministry that this congregation does through its Coronavirus Relief Fund. Bless also the efforts of our peacekeepers, first responders, military personnel, relief workers, and missionaries, especially our own Erica, Patrick, Claire, Scott, Nate, Carter, Ellen, Jonathan, Matthew, Brian, Sarah, Bob, Yasmin, Mark, Megan, Krista, Joel, Alex, and Carson. Lord, hear our prayer. You hear us calling, you hear us calling, Abba Father. You hear us calling, you hear us calling, Abba Father. Lord, have mercy, Christ have mercy. 
Holy One, you care for those who are harassed and helpless. Protect and defend those who are hurt or abused. Heal those who are sick. Feed all who hunger. Empower all whose voices go unheard and help us respond to the pressing needs of our neighbors. Console, heal, and nourish all in need, especially Leslie, Donna, Martin, David, and our friends and family who request our prayers. We call on your spirit of healing and comfort to all the families whose loved ones have died or are suffering from the pandemic, as well as those suffering from mental health issues like the pandemic of fear. Provide leadership for congregations that are now struggling without church workers and pastors who have become infected and ill. Safeguard those with underlying health issues. Put your healing touch on those infected, those awaiting test results, family members sequestered from their loved ones, those on the front lines treating patients, and the scientists and lab workers working night and day despite their exhaustion to develop accurate tests, safe vaccines, and effective therapeutics. Lord, continue your ministry through the work of doctors, nurses, physical therapists, researchers, midwives, chaplains, counselors, hospice workers, other health professionals, those who serve in the funeral industry, and all who tend to human bodies, many of whom put themselves in harm's way, including our own Barry, Alexia, Carol Lee, Chad, Sandra, Laura, David, Megan, Jennifer, and Errol. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Holy One, you provide a plentiful harvest of gifts and resources. Prepare us to labor and gather the fruits of this congregation that we might discover new ways of living. Minister to us in our work that we do not lose heart. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. We call on your spirit of hope. Endow our return to campus committee wisdom, discernment, and strength as they plan our return to worshiping together in person. Provide all of us understanding and empathy for each other's opinions, cares, frailties, concerns, and needs as we plan our reopening. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. We celebrate the birthdays this week of Ben, Eric, Jean, Sally, Ben, and Ryan. May their birthday cake candles and their shared love as Christ followers be symbols of Pentecost peace, power, wind, and light in the midst of darkness, disease, destruction, and despair. Lord, hear our prayer. You hear us calling, you hear us calling, Abba Father. You hear us calling, you hear us calling, Abba Father. Lord, Receive these prayers, O God, and those too deep for words. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We continue with the prayer our Lord taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Dear siblings in Christ, neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers nor things present 
nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. God the Creator, Jesus our Savior, and the Holy Spirit the Comforter bless you and keep you in eternal love. Amen. song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus the name above every other name Jesus the only one who could ever see Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Your heart and lead me in your love to the Lord's 
Folks, cling to God's strength and hope and share the good news which overcomes all things using the powerful gifts God has given you, including the counsel of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. That tomb is empty. The beautiful rooms, gardens, fellowship halls, sanctuaries in heaven, your real home await you. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.